There's a psychologist named Piaget. Some of you might know about him. <clears throat> Piaget was very interested in what happens to value structures and their hierarchical organization once they have to apply outside of the confines of a body. So, so here's a way of thinking about it. Two-year-olds basically hypothalamic. That's why they're so much fun. First they're happy, then they're sad, then they're hungry, then they're tired. You know, they just zip from one pretty straightforward and rather awe-inspiring motivational state to another. And, but at two, they can't play. They can play with, by themselves, but they can't play with other children. They can't get that until they're three. And they need to get it by the time they're three, because if they don't get it by the time they're four, they will never get it. And then you have an antisocial kid who's going to be an outsider for his entire life, and there isn't anything you can do about it. So that has to happen between two and four. So what happens at about age three is that the kid learns how to play a game with another person. And what that game is, is fundamentally the development of the ability to share a frame of reference, which is what you're doing when you play Monopoly. It's like it's stupid to play Monopoly, obviously. Who cares if you have a whole pile of counterfeit paper, right? <laughs> but it doesn't matter, eh? Because the way you're constituted is that your brain will treat anything you act like constitutes a valuable goal as if it's a valid framework of reference. And if it couldn't do that, A, you couldn't abstract, and B, you could not get along with other people. So you can sit around the table and you can say, let's pretend that monopoly is a reasonable facsimile of reality, which you wouldn't say, but it's what you mean. And everybody says, yes, that would be amusing. <laughs> and so then you set your goal, which is to get all the little hotels and all the money, and poof, your emotions go along for the ride. And what's so interesting about that is you can get everybody into the game. And so one of the things that's really interesting about people is that we can establish a shared fictional frame of reference and it organizes all our emotions so they're predictable. That's also why we can watch movies. You go to a movie, you identify the hero. You figure out what the hero wants, poof, you're the hero. And the way that works is you don't look at the hero and think about what he's doing and evaluate it emotionally and then feel it. What you do is you specify the hero's goal and then you map him onto your body and you read off the emotional responses of your own body and that's how you understand the hero. So it's, in, it's embodied, you're, you're using your, em, your embodiment as a computational device that can run simulations of other consciousnesses. And it does that with the body. And we like doing that. You can go to a movie and you know, you're Brad Pitt for an hour and a half. You know, and you're Brad Pitt doing remarkable things. And that's also how we understand other people. We're very good at that. So anyways, we have these shared frames of reference, like when we're playing Monopoly. Okay, so children at three learn how to play games. And that means they learn how to organize their own internal motivational states into a hierarchy that includes the motivational states of other people. And that means they can play. And that's what you guys do when you're out in the world. Like, we're playing a game right now. We all know the rules. And that's why we can all sit in this room and play the game without fighting with each other. You know, and the, the room is set up like a theater, and we all know the theater game. And so, and the chairs are always facing this way at the moment, and so that's a hint that you should look forward. And this is raised, so, you know, the room is basically telling you what to do, because it's a stage, like all rooms. And because you're smart and socially conscious, you can walk into a staged room and your body knows what to do. And if you're civilized and social, you just do it, then all the other primates can predict what you're up to and they won't kill you. <laughs> yeah, well that's what it means to be part of the same tribe. You know, and people are very peculiar creatures and God only knows what they're up to. But as long as they're playing the same game you are, you don't have to know what they're up to because you can predict what they're going to do and you understand their motivational states. And so, part of the building and constructing of higher order, motive, higher order moral goals is the establishment of joint frames of reference that allow multiple people to pursue the goals that they're interested in simultaneously. And then what you have to think about with regards to that is that not all shared frames of reference can manage that. There's a small subset of them that are optimized so that not only can multiple people play them, but multiple people can play them and enjoy them and do it repeatedly across a long period of time. So it's iteratability that partly defines the utility of a higher order moral structure. And that is not arbitrary. 
It's an emergent property of biological interactions. And you might say, well, it's kind of arbitrary because people can do what they want. But it's not arbitrary at all. Because a lot of what's constraining your games is your motivational substructure and those ancient circuits that are status-oriented. And they operate within... Virtually every animal has a status counter. Creatures organize themselves into dominance hierarchies. The reason they do that is because that works. It's a solution. It's a solution to the Darwinian problem of existence. It's not just an epiphenomena. It's the real thing. So you, your environment fundamentally, a huge chunk of your environment is dominance hierarchy plus God only knows where you are. And that's order and chaos. And part of the reason that people fight to preserve their dominance hierarchies is because it's better to be a slave who knows what the hell is going on than someone who's thrown screaming and naked into the jungle at night. And that's the difference between order and chaos. And we like order better than chaos, and it's no wonder. Now, we'll invite a little chaos in for entertainment now and then, but it has to be done voluntarily. And generally, you don't want the kind of chaos that upsets your entire conceptual structure. You know, you're willing to fool around on the fringes a little bit, but, you know, when the going gets serious, you're pretty much likely to bail out. And no wonder.